Good evening and welcome to ATV News. I'm Charity Pepezani. Here are your top stories this Monday. A Zimbabwean politician, Fidelis Mashu, has admitted to an incestuous relationship with his two nieces. Mashu of MDCT claimed he was severely lonely after his wife left for the United Kingdom in 2003 and never returned. The relationships have resulted in the birth of four children. Mashu, the Chitungwiza North legislator and former housing minister, now faces charges of engaging in ancestral relationships. The 70-year-old commented that he was lonely when his wife and children left the country for the UK. He then requested for assistance from his nieces at family level, but unfortunately they ended up falling in love. He added that it was untrue that he raped them. Mashu has been fined 15 heads of cattle for the offences and he is appealing the fine, describing it as a ridiculous amount. Some residents in Zimbabwe's second largest city, Bulawayo, have apparently spent eight years without electricity. The situation has led to an increase in property damage due to fires as residents have sought alternative sources of energy. Bulawayo Progressive Residents Association wrote a statement to Zisa urging them to connect power to some of the Pamula South and Mgowini. The BPRA alleged that people are spending around $3 a day on firewood and also that some females are exposed to sexual abuse as they search the bushes for the firewood. Joining us to discuss this is Nigel Mugamu who is a commentator and blogger based in Harare. So eight years is a long time, Nigel. How have things got this bad? Um, look, the the situation in Bulawayo is not limited to Bulawayo itself. You know, it's it's something that that um, occurs across the country. Um, you know, if we if we don't invest in infrastructure, and we haven't invested in a lot of infrastructure um, in a long time, um, things are bound to get this way. So, do you think that it's fair that people are blaming Zissa for um, all the the problems that are going on there? Um, no, I don't. I don't think it's fair to to apportion uh, blame solely on Zissa. I think that uh, you know there are situations where people are you know even now with with with, with infrastructure, whether it's cabling or or, or, or you know um, I mean people steal people have stolen and continue to steal. Um, some of the major equipment, um, for whatever reason. I mean, some people have actually stolen. I think there's, we've got what they call um, transmitted. I think they call, where, um, and there's some some sort of e diesel or oil in, 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 in these transmitters, and they've, they've stolen the oil. So, it's it's. I, I wouldn't apportion all the blame to to Zessa. I think that there are also some people out there, members of the public, who are um, clearly involved in theft uh, for whatever reason. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put the blame on them. Yeah, so you know, like, like you said, the members of public also might be involved in theft and everything else. What does this mean for them? Because, you know, the normal person that's sitting at home who doesn't have electricity in their house, you know, how are they supposed to react to this kind of situation? What I've found is that uh, in these sort of communities, well, in communities, you, someone knows something about someone stealing this stuff. That's that's generally the case. I don't think, I don't think it's it's an isolated incident. I don't think that um, uh, I think there are a lot of people who, who would know, uh, or there's someone certainly who would know what's going on, what's happened, um, what the you know why the cable, uh, why the cables are being stolen. Um, I think we've just gone back to. A sad situation where we we don't snitch, you know. You don't want to you don't want to get yourself into trouble, so you keep quiet and uh, and you and in our typical Zimbabwean way, we make a plan. So, if I had electricity, um, I've always had if I've had, if I've had electricity for the past four years, someone c comes along and steals a cable tonight, and then obviously it affects me tomorrow, and I don't want to get myself into trouble. Um, I will make a plan. I'll you know run a generator. I'll get a solar lamp. I'll Make plan, and that's typically what we do. Nigel, thank you so much for joining me to discuss this topic today. A court in Zimbabwe has heard that a supermodel who was crowned Miss Face of Zimbabwe brutally aborted a pregnancy. 
the model and the boyfriend plotted and terminated her pregnancy before burning the fetus in a rubbish bin, the court heard. 25-year-old Gamuchurai Maziva and her 23-year-old boyfriend Nyasha Maidadi were charged with unlawful termination of pregnancy by Harare magistrate Ms. Olivia Mariga. The duo were granted bail for 100 US dollars on the condition that they report to the police and stay at their given address. A Malawi Catholic University has reopened today after its indefinite closure last Wednesday following constant demonstrations from students because of water shortages. The first peaceful demonstration by students started on September 15th after the campus went for six weeks without running water. A signed statement by the university's registrar suggested that all the issues that led to the closure have been dealt with and students have reported to their classes as normal. A Zambian contestant has won Miss Malaika UK, which was held in London on Saturday. Jane Chalembe was presented with her award by Sonia Bolt, who held the title of Top Model of the World for Zimbabwe in 2010. Miss Malaika is a project linked to the Mumba Children Charity, which also celebrated its 10th anniversary. The children's project was set up in memory of Brian Mumba Mulenga, who passed away in 2002 in a road accident. It was founded by his mother, Hilda Mulenga. The beauty pageant consisted of 10 contestants from Botswana, Uganda, Zambia and Zimbabwe. The theme for this year was road safety. In other entertainment news, Big Brother UK runner-up Makosi Musambasi has returned to Zimbabwe after 13 years. The celebrity once appeared topless on the show and created divided opinion among viewers. The star is trying to win the hearts of Zimbabweans with a new lifestyle talk show that she hopes to air on local TV. Now, with all the fallouts from a dramatic weekend in the English Premier League, let's cross to Liam and Michael. Thanks, Charity. And that is correct. It was an enormous weekend in the Barclays Premier League. Really significant. And there was goals, calamitous refereeing decisions, red cards all over the place. It was really memorable. Um, the first game we're going to look at is Man City against Swansea. Now, as you'll remember, City had that really bad defeat in the Champions League to Ajax, comfortably beaten 3-1, and they really needed to get back to winning ways at home to a struggling Swansea side. They did just that. They won 1-0 with a thumping 25-yard effort from the Argentine Carlos Tevez. City, as they have been this season, were not at their best, but they, the important thing was three points on the board, and they did just that. Now, Michael is here to discuss things with me as usual. We've talked before about City scraping through results. They did that again, didn't they, against Swansea? Yeah, uh, well at the moment City has, have not yet started playing well, they're still grinding results, the 1-0, 2-1, 3-2 uh, kind of results, so the most important thing for them is the three points and, and to stay as close to the top as possible. And that's true, they are now just one point behind Chelsea and the fact that they've done that without, as you say, without playing well is quite scary for the rest of the league, isn't it? Well, it is scary if, if they are able to pick up their, their game and at the same time maybe that's the best they, they can play at the moment. So it's kind of scary and uh, well, we just have to wait and see. We will have to wait and see and they uh, continue their march up the league, just one point behind leaders Chelsea now. We come to Arsenal and my colleague Mr Mambo was a little bit apprehensive about this game against the QPR side who were absolutely desperate for a win. They went to the Emirates, rooted to the bottom of the Premier League. Arsenal again haven't been convincing of late and have, as well as City lost in midweek in the Champions League but they again did just what they needed to do, scrape through 1-0 with a Mikel Arteta goal late on in the game. They had their chances Arsenal but QPR also could have had a goal or two themselves and their keeper Julius Cesar was basically keeping them in the game from start to finish. Now, Michael, you thought you might slip to a draw here. Were you relieved to get away with a 1-0 win? Well, I was relieved to, for Arsenal to win 1-0, but at the end of the day, they did not play as a team that should be competing for the league. They played as a team that's competing for 
third place, fourth place, Champions League spot, and that's not that's not enough for the supporters. If you if you know Arsenal has the highest uh, ticket uh, prices within the Premier League, and if you're going to be charging people the highest, you should be up there performing. It's interesting you say that because Arsene Wenger has come out today and said that getting fourth place in the Premier League is a priority, and that's just not enough for Arsenal fans who've waited since 2005 for a trophy. Well, like, like from my, my own opinion, I think uh, the coach is more of a shareholder than a coach anymore because his, his, his main focus is for the team to make money, whereas supporters want to win, players want to win. So something is fundamentally wrong at Arsenal. Now, something that's fundamentally right at Arsenal is the return of Jack Wilshere, and he came on for his first game in around 18 months, and he really played quite well considering his first game back, didn't he? He, he played really well and uh, I, I hope they look after him uh, much better, maybe uh, 30 minutes there, 45 minutes there, not uh, having to play him for 60 odd minutes when he's not fully match fit. He's been out for too long and uh, you, you risk having the same situation with Diaby when he was out for too long. He played five games in a row, after that he was injured. OK, so Arsenal, just like City, just doing enough and getting away with a 1-0 win. And now we get to Super Sunday, or as it may now be known, Controversial Sunday. There was all sorts of decisions that went against teams on Sunday. We start with the Merseyside derby, Everton v Liverpool, and it ended in a controversial, as I say, 2 all draw. Liverpool fans will be really, really annoyed because they took a 2-0 lead, both goals from the Uruguayan striker Luis Suarez. One of these, by the way, he celebrated by mocking a dive in front of Everton manager David Moyes. This was in response to David Moyes' comments in the press calling Luis Suarez a diver. So 2-0 up at half-time, well before half-time, sorry, and Everton responded with two quick goals and it was 2 all going into the second half. Late on though, and this is where the controversial moment happened, Suarez scored what turned out to be a legitimate winner but it was ruled out for offside and of course the Liverpool players, fans, everyone was outraged. But the result finished 2 all, which I'd like to point out I predicted it was 2 all. <laughs> um, but I mean, it was a terrible decision, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, I, well, you predicted correctly, but it was based on a terrible decision. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's a travesty for justice. Uh, in 2012, that we, sti we still have uh, games that are decided by controversial issues when there is clearly video technology that can aid referees in making these decisions. And looking at other sports like cricket, uh, uh, rugby, the, these things are decided in a matter of seconds. I don't know why uh, the Premier League or FIFA have not moved in a lot quicker to get video technology in place. Well, that's a good point, and I mean, if you were a Liverpool fan waking up the day after, you'd be totally outraged because they should have won the game. But both sides played some good football, and Liverpool, as we've discussed, are starting to pick up points, starting to play well. Players like Suarez coming into form. Do you see them having a good season now? Well, it's, it's not a matter of like having one game when you play well, because at the moment it's, it's about the first 11 plus the next 11 that are going to come in. A team is obviously going to get injuries. After, let's say when Suarez is injured, who do you see coming in to replace him? It's a good point. It's a good point. And uh, as we predicted on, on uh, Friday's ATV, it was a very feisty affair. Honours shared in the end, two all. And we've come to the biggest game of all, Manchester United away at Chelsea and continuing the theme of controversial decisions, this one was simply full of them. United got off to a blistering start, take, going 2-0 up in the first 15 minutes. The first goal was an own goal by David Luiz and then Robin van Persie continued his rich reign of form, getting the second. United then took their foot off the gas and a Juan Mata free kick pulled them one back just before half-time. Then the Brazilian midfielder Ramirez headed home to make it 2 all. Now at this stage, as me and Mike were saying before, it was heading for game of the season. But then the referee took over, didn't he? Yeah, the referee had one of the worst uh, games imaginable uh, with uh, two controversial decisions that basically ended what was a terrific match. Just to clear up on that, the Firstly, he sent off Chelsea defender Branislav Ivanovic for hauling down Ashley Young when he was clean through on goal. That was a straight red card. Then he also sent off Chelsea striker Fernando Torres, a second yellow card, for diving, although footage shows that he was actually tackled or fouled even 
by United defender Johnny Evans. So down to nine men and the impetus was with United, who went on to win 3-2. But the controversy didn't end there. Chicharito, Javier Hernandez, the United striker, scored the winner when he was in an offside position. So if you're a Chelsea manager now, you'd just feel like the world's against you, wouldn't you? Not really. If, if I was a Chelsea manager right now, I'd be proud of the way the team responded, having gone down 2-0 and still lost two players or well, the first, the second one to a controversial red card. But even if you look at uh, the first red card, fair fine there was minimum contact, but uh, look at the way Ashley Young falls, it's just the same way all the time. If, if a player is going to be fouled, at least fall a different way, not the, not the same type. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I think most people would agree that it, it was a foul, but he doesn't help himself, does he? Because he's building a reputation for that sort of dramatic dive that he does. I'm, I'm glad you called it a dramatic dive, not me. <laughs> yeah, uh, Chelsea played really, really well and uh, each and every one of those players will be happy. And when decisions like this go against you, you, you have that uh, belief that let's go out and win the, the Premier League one way or the other. But there was an interesting point made in today's English newspapers People say these decisions often even out over the course of the league season, but there might not be a more important game for Chelsea and they don't get to play it again, do they? They don't, they don't get to play it again. It's, it's gone and that's it. And at the end of the day, we, we cannot rely on a system whereby we say they sort of even out when, when the technology is there. Come on, we're not talking of uh, Premier League in Africa. We're talking of the UK where where you probably have over 100 cameras on that match, on that day. You tell me the referee cannot spare even two seconds just to consult, yeah? Every, every, by the time they were standing back waiting to take, to, to restart the match after the third goal, everyone watching on TV knew it wasn't a goal. See? That's how long it took. It's big words for Michael Mambo and it's a debate that's guaranteed to continue. But, unfortunately for Chelsea, it didn't change the result. United winning 3-2 and joining City just one point behind Chelsea. It's certainly shaping up to be an exciting title race at this stage. Speaking of excitement, next week is the big one in the ACB office. Man United, my personal team, against Michael Mambo's Arsenal. So join us on Friday when we'll be trading blows about who's going to win that one. And today's photo of the day has been awarded to Palma Francisco Moale. Keep sending us your great pictures to our ATV Facebook page and you could appear on the big screen. Thank you for watching ATV News and have a lovely evening.